Chapter 4 A New Cold War Following his ascent to power in 2000, Russian President Vladimir Putin engaged in a long-term campaign of consolidating power internally and expanding Russia's influence globally. As early as 2008, journalist Edward Lucas argued that Putin was waging a new Cold War against the West. Luke Harding was The Guardian's Moscow correspondent from 2007 until he was deported in 2011. When I arrived in Moscow in 2007, I didn't think, oh, this is a terrible place, let me write nasty stories about Putin. I thought, actually, this country is somewhat darker than I anticipated, let me kind of chronicle what's going on. And I was kind of writing these stories, and then the sky fell on my head, actually, and that we had a series of break-ins at our apartment, and, and we were advised by the British Embassy that our, our flat was bugged, and that the, our bedroom was bugged, and there was video in the bedroom. Uh, and it was pretty squalid. It was like something out of a kind of bad version of John Le Carre, actually, but without the superior dialogue and the, the trench coats. The opening act of the new Cold War was the murder of Russian dissident Alexander Litvinenko in November 2006 in central London. Litvinenko was poisoned with a massive dose of polonium-210. The radioactive trail traced around London's restaurants, bars, hotels, public transport, and even British Airways planes led British investigators to two Kremlin agents who fled back to Russia. The official inquiry into the death of Alexander Litvinenko pointed the finger personally at Vladimir Putin. When Mr. Lugovoy poisoned Mr. Litvinenko, it is probable that he did so under the direction of the FSB. I would add that I regard that as a strong probability. The FSB operation to kill Mr. Litvinenko was probably approved by Mr. Petrushev, head of the FSB, and also by President Putin. It's a little bit hard for Western leaders to comprehend that when they see Vladimir Putin, whether it's at the G8 or the G20, he is someone who, we think, actually personally authorizes the murder of enemies. That's slightly different from a drone strike. I mean, it's not a sort of zero something, but actually he tends to murder people he doesn't like, personally. Uh, and that makes him very dangerous indeed. You look at his um, campaigns over the last few years, and he's portraying himself very much in a sort of old-fashioned, you know, father, father of the country. It's Putin wrestling a bear, Putin fishing, Putin, Putin the, the, the father of the people in the way that 100 and 50 years ago, the Tsar was seen as the father of the people in the way that Stalin tried to have himself portrayed as the father of the people. I mean, what I do think is a problem is that, that Putin and others in his, uh, in his entourage or, you know, in his government, his, um, uh, in the, among the Russian authorities, uh, have a, a quite an old-fashioned idea of, of sort of spheres of influence uh, in which smaller countries between the major powers are not really supposed to have agency of their own. And the Russians often talked when I was in Moscow in the 1990s and probably still talk about the subjects and the objects of international relations. And they always regarded Russia as a subject. You know, Russia was a country which did things, whereas countries like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, were objects of international relations. They were countries to which things were done. And I think that's still a problem in the way that, that Putin looks at the world. During the last 15 years, there has been a gradual escalation of Russian operations across the West. There is now overwhelming evidence that the Russian government is engaging in a carefully orchestrated strategic campaign whose purpose is to annex or control territories that used to belong to the Soviet Union, such as Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia, Crimea and the Donbass in Ukraine, and Transnistria in Moldova, to expand Russia's influence in the Balkans by interfering in the domestic politics of countries such as Montenegro and North Macedonia, to erode liberal democracy throughout Europe, from Finland and Norway, to Hungary and the Czech Republic, to Italy, France, Germany and Britain as well as in the United States, and ultimately to weaken NATO and the European Union. 
This campaign uses what has become known as hybrid warfare, combining covert military and intelligence operations and tapping into networks of organized crime, hacking and money laundering, launching cyber attacks against government agencies, private companies, journalists and academics, exercising political influence in domestic audiences, spreading misinformation on social media, engaging in character assassinations and interfering in elections and referenda by stirring hatred and by directly funding and indirectly supporting radical populists and political parties of the far right and the far left. There have been pretty good academic studies showing that there was quite a big social media uh, operation by Russian trolls around Brexit in favour of Brexit in 2016. And yet we have a Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who says he's seen no evidence of Russian interference. Now, we know that the, the, the Russians tried on all over the place, not just in the US, but across Europe. They promote separatism in places like Catalonia. They, they boost the far right, not just in, in Eastern Europe, Hungary, Poland, but also places like France. Facing domestic, political and economic problems, as well as a crisis of identity and values in the globalized 21st century, the West has so far struggled to formulate a coherent response to the Russian president's strategy. The volume and partial success of Russian operations across Europe and the United States demonstrate the absence of a credible and effective strategy of deterrence. Maybe when uh, in 2014 Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea, even before that, when in 2008 Vladimir Putin uh, fought Georgia on Georgian territory, there was no um, answer from the Western world. There was no tough answer. What we have now is that the world, the Western world, is kind of a, you know, flexible with the things that are going on in, in, in that part of the world. I think that if um, in 2008, when there was a Bucharest summit of NATO, uh, and when NATO leaders decided not to grant Georgia and Ukraine with the membership action plan map, this was the biggest mistake made you know, during this 20, 30 years. Because um, if Georgia would become this, you know, not, not a member of NATO at all, but if Georgia would have this membership action plan, if Ukraine would have this membership action plan, there would be no war in Georgia in August 2008. There would be no Crimea annexation in uh, 2014. There would be no Donbass issue now. The weakness of the Western world, um, unfortunately, was obvious at that time to us, people who work there and who live there, who understand what's going on. Um, and it's becoming more and more obvious now. The territory of Ukraine has now become the frontier of tensions between Russia and the West. It's a slightly trickier situation in that sense, in that although there is a very strong Ukrainian identity, it had not had its own independence prior to World War II. I think we've seen the expansion of NATO into areas that were independent countries uh, between the wars. And that, that, that's, even though the Soviet Union considered the Baltic states, for example, to be part of their territory, the people in the Baltic states considered themselves independent and westward looking. Ukraine um, particularly saw itself as the most westward looking part of the Soviet Union and part of Russia, but it was because it didn't have that history as an independent state that's made it tricky. You know, he, he um, said to George Bush in 2008 that Ukraine was not a real country. He said in 2013, before the uh, annexation of Crimea and so on, um, that Russia and Ukraine were one people. Um, that's not how it looks to people who are sitting in Kiev. You know, for them, uh, they are an independent country. They have sovereign rights. They're a member of the United, States, uh, United Nations with the same uh, rights and privileges as any other country. Um, and so I think, you know, there is, there's a, there is a, an issue of perception that for many of the people who rule Russia, people on Russia's borders 
don't have quite the sovereign equality that under the UN Charter they're supposed to have. If the new Cold War started with the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko, then another poisoning on British soil in March 2018 proved to be a turning point in the West's response to Russian aggression. Well, I think the Salisbury attack on, on Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia is very interesting. You have to ask yourself, why did the Russians decide to, to murder or try and murder a former intelligence officer who, who frankly was, was in retirement eight years after he'd been, been swapped out, living a quiet life and so on. And I think the answer to that is twofold. One is to send a sign to, to the British uh, and, and their American allies and to NATO countries generally that Russia can behave with impunity and, and do special operations on, on the territory of the European Union. But I think the bigger message was to Russia's own elite to say that essentially if you betray the motherland, if you cooperate with the CIA, if you talk to the FBI and Robert Mueller, then we will come for you at a time of our choosing uh, and we will smash you. By October 2018, investigative journalists and British authorities had positively identified the perpetrators of the Salisbury attack as high-ranking officers of Russia's military intelligence service, the GRU. Following the Salisbury attack, Russian-controlled media and Twitter accounts produced and disseminated not one or two, but 46 different theories for the incident, ranging from the most innocent to the most absurd, trying to absolve the Russian authorities of any responsibility. The point of this fake news campaign was not to promote one particular version of the truth, but to make truth irrelevant by sowing confusion and by eroding the credibility of UK authorities. Confusion and dissent are key elements of hybrid warfare. In a rare public statement in 2007, Jonathan Evans, the then Director General of MI5, the British Security Service, said that since the end of the Cold War, we have seen no decrease in the numbers of undeclared Russian intelligence officers in the UK, at the Russian Embassy and associated organizations conducting covert activity in this country. Sergei Tretyakov, the New York Station Chief for Russian Intelligence, who defected in 2000, revealed that Moscow's active measures never subsided. So did the Cold War ever end? So did the Cold War end? Um, yes, it did, I believe, end at one level with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the way that we were uh, able to uh, embrace the new democracies, as we then called them in Central and Eastern Europe. And Russia uh, developed into a different political um, animal, I, 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 you know, some form of democracy of some sort came into being in the former Soviet Union. I, I mean, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I look at it like this. You, you can think about it as geopolitics, in which case, I think the Cold War did stop for a while in the 1990s. But if you look at it psychologically, certainly in the minds of Putin and people around him who are hardliners, who are KGB people, who view America as the, the Glavni Protivnik, the, the, the main enemy, as the KGB put it, for them the Cold War never ended. There was merely a, a moment of, of weakness and national humiliation. And then with Putin in power and with, with budgets being floated by rising oil revenues in the noughties, Russia was in a position to do something about this. And we're now in a kind of strange situation where we have the Soviet playbook uh, of spying and assassination and active measures, but the Soviet Union has gone. So it's been de-ideologized. It's not about capitalism versus communism anymore, but the same methods um, of undermining Western society, of attacking NATO, um, of adversarialism are, are absolutely there, alive and well. I think Russia remains a significant security challenge, not so much because I think, you know, Russian tanks are going to come over the border. We're not back to the, the, the situation on the inner German border with, you know, tank divisions facing each other across a, a fortified frontier. But in a sense, what we see now is um, a much more fluid um, attempt to undermine both the unity of the EU and NATO um, and the, 
the liberal political consensus within countries. Putin has, be, has proved to be an extremely effective disruptor. Uh, and in some ways, I think you know, that's a good strategy for a country which is in Russia's position. And what Putin has done very effectively is to look for ways in which, if he can't strengthen Russia, he can weaken Russia's potential adversaries. And you know, one of the ways that you can do that is by looking for divisions between them or within them and then exploiting those. And he's done that very well. The thing about Putin is Putin is not some super evil uh, gremlin guy s sitting in a cave with spooky lighting at a console, pushing a button here, you know, boomf, something happens in the UK, boomf, pushing a button here, something happens in kind of Wisconsin. That's not how it works. He is just an opportunist uh, whose philosophy is let's try it and see. And if it doesn't work, we try something else. And quite often you'll try two things simultaneously. So Brexit referendum, hey, it looks quite close. Let's push Brexit because that would be bad for the European Union and make Britain weaker economically, militarily, politically. You know, Donald Trump, the guy's a joke, but hell, he discredits the whole American election system. So let's push Trump and try and smash down Hillary and so on. So it's, it's opportunism. It's only possible because our societies are, yes, are weak, divided. There's a big culture war in America. There's a kind of nascent culture war here. Uh, and so on. So it's, it's not that Putin creates problems, it's that he, he exploits and instrumentalizes problems which are already there and he makes them worse. He's, he's, we have a fire and then he's the guy who puts half a jerry can of kerosene on the fire so it flames up higher. So we have to stop him from, from reaching for the jerry can. That, that's what we need to do. Perhaps the most fundamental security challenge currently facing the West does not come from external competitors, but from within. The lack of a visible danger means that many people now take their freedom and security for granted. The notion that uh, you can suffer a military invasion or your freedom could be wiped out overnight, uh, uh, even the worry about nuclear exchanges that you know, dominated my childhood when we had to do nuclear civil uh, uh, emergency drills in school. A, a lot of that has gone. Uh, it's a good thing in a way because it means that people now see security as something which is to be expected rather than to be sort of uh, acquired and preserved uh, with great anxiety. But there is a danger to that, a a absolutely, in, in terms of people's willingness to invest in, in, in defence. Uh, uh, for instance, they're willing to sacrifice for the benefit of others uh, in the name of collective solidarity, uh, 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 for instance, but also change in security, and NATO has to be mindful of this as well. Uh, I don't just blame the public for not being, if you like, more conscious of security. I think it's very difficult, looking back, for some people to remember what it's, it was like, and certainly for today's generation to really understand um, what it was like, the, the fear the, what, that there was, the, the tensions between um, the superpowers of, of the United States and the Soviet Union. In October 2019, we interviewed communication and journalism students at Bournemouth University in the UK. We asked them what was the first word that came to mind when they think of NATO. Security. Nothing else comes to mind. <laughs> Security. I would say freedom. War. Or more like prevention of war. Yeah, I think that's it. This, this is awkward. Security. Alliance. Unity. Um, Safety, response. I'll go with alliance, uh, military, cooperation, bureaucracy, waste. These students had just spent a semester studying global current affairs, engaging with deterrence theory and the history of the Cold War and the mission and role of NATO. The first thing that immediately emerged was a significant knowledge gap about what NATO is and does. Before studying um, global current affairs, I knew nothing about NATO. Quite, like, I knew, I'd heard of NATO, um, I'd heard about it in the news, I'd probably, I've read a few things, 
kind of where NATO's name has been littered into a news article, um, but actually what NATO did or who they were, I had no idea. I don't think people know literally anything about European security. Even being in a course surrounded by journalism students, a lot of people felt like they were learning NATO from scratch. And so I had to do a lot of um, groundwork before they actually started our project. Yeah, when I was travelling and decided I was going to do this interview, lots of people were saying to me, what, what is NATO? What do they actually do? Because they had no idea what they do. I actually did a survey of fa like my Facebook friends, females on my Facebook group, and out of nearly 100, only 15% actually knew what NATO was and does. I think the future of NATO depends on our generation and younger people to know about it. We've grown up in a time of peace, so I mean I don't blame people for not knowing about it because we haven't, thankfully, haven't had to know. There's definitely a knowledge gap. I think millennials, because I was born in 99, I think people from my age and probably a few years before never heard of deterrence theory, know very little about NATO. Um, their knowledge of the Cold War and those sort of incidents would be based on history class in year eight. So the only thing that I found people did know about NATO was uh, the concept of mutually assured destruction, um, but that was the only thing that say, they knew about. Any international organisation needs public support. Uh, and, you know, they are, international organisations by their nature are quite bureaucratic and a lot of what goes on in there is quite hard to understand. But there are still relatively simple messages about what international organisations are for. And I think, you know, sometimes people of my generation or older who did experience at least some of the Cold War take it for granted that it's obvious why NATO exists and should continue to exist. Actually, I think from, you know, from year to year, from generation to generation, you have to renew the story of why it is that collective defence and security is a good thing and keeps us all safer. I think people know a lot less than um, sort of the experts assume they do. Even my family and things, they don't really know anything about NATO, mm -hmm. current day NATO. I think children, I think teenagers, they have to be aware of this because it's just a matter of your personal security. It's just a, a, not even a matter of, uh, I'm not even talking globally right now, I'm talking about your personal security, your family's security. This is something everyone needs to know about. As it approached its 70th anniversary, NATO's own relevance was brought into question. Faced with existential pressure from within and an orchestrated campaign of hybrid war from the outside, can NATO still protect us? Is the concept of deterrence still relevant in an age of Twitter bots, hackers and social media algorithms? Is NATO a relic of the Cold War? And perhaps most crucially, can NATO engage younger generations in a dialogue about our common security?